Gift Biz Unwrapped, Episode 176. Let me say it in the most unhelpful way. Stop it! Attention gifters, bakers, crafters, and makers. Pursuing your dream can be fun. Whether you have an established business or are looking to start one now, you are in the right place. This is Gift Biz Unwrapped, helping you turn your skill into a flourishing business. Join us for an episode packed full of invaluable guidance, resources, and the support you need to grow your gift biz. Here is your host, gift biz gal, Sue Monheit. Hi there, it's Sue, and thank you for spending a little bit of your time with me today. Once you've listened to the show, if you want to make sure that you catch every episode, go over on Apple Podcasts and click that little subscribe button. That way, every time an episode is released, it'll automatically come down to your phone or your computer, wherever you like to listen to the show. Also, for my Android listeners, I want to make sure that you are aware of the new Google Podcast app, a fabulous new addition so that you can listen to your podcast effectively there too. Additionally, if you'd like even more gift biz motivation, I want to make sure that you're familiar with our private Facebook group called Gift Biz Breeze. You know, pursuing your business should be fun, exciting, rewarding, energizing. But as you start getting into the thick of things, it can become really stressful and downright scary. When you join the breeze, it's like sitting in the park with friends who bring you all the support and the answers that you need and that you've been looking for. The group that's come together in The Breeze is an amazing collection of creators, and you get to know each of them and mingle with them and talk with them, and we all share together the growth of our business. One of my favorite things that we do there is one day a week, everyone can post what they're working on. It could be a new product they're creating. It could be a seasonal product that really is flying off the shelves. I can't tell you how beautiful and creative and original and unique so many of these products are. It is so fun to see. And it gives all of us other ideas, not to copy, but for inspiration of what we can do and apply to our own businesses. To join the breeze, just go over to giftbizbreeze.com. And now it's time to get on to the show. Oh, Gift Biz listeners, you are in for such a treat. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Susan Rowan. Susan is the author of the bestseller, How to Work a Room. I'm quite sure many of you have already read it. The book has sold over 1.2 million copies in 14 countries. She has also authored The Secrets of Savvy Networking, which is also a bestseller. Susan is an in-demand international keynote speaker who has shared her message of connection and communication with audiences worldwide. She was quoted by Sir Richard Branson as number six in his 10 quotes to make things happen. Her clients include Coca-Cola, the U.S. Air Force, and Apple Computer, to name a few. But her personal favorite is Hershey chocolate. Mine too. Please join (laughs) me in welcoming my guest, keynote speaker, best-selling author, and the mingling maven, Susan Rowan. Susan, welcome to the Gift Biz Unwrapped podcast. Oh, well, thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to this. I am so excited, and we're just going to kick it off by telling everybody how we got connected. It's so crazy. And I usually say, let's do the candle first, but let's just do that story first. Do you want to take it away, or should I? You do the start of it because you have (laughs) the beginning. Okay. Let me just preface this by saying the world is our oyster and you never know. My biggest marketing for any business, any craft, anything you're doing is keep your antenna up because you never know. Take it away, Sue. Yeah, you just never know. So Gift Biz listeners, you might have even seen my Instagram story of, oh, I think it's been a month ago now. We had a local fine arts craft fair right in our community. And I said, it's a perfect time to do demonstrations of good booth setup, booth interaction, etc. 
So it's a Sunday and I'm here for business, right? I'm not just personal looking at crafts, although it was super fun. And I'm just walking through the booths and I meet up with one of my friends, Cheryl, and she was making reference to the fact that my book just came out. And so we were talking, one thing led to another. And she said, well, you know who my college roommate was. And I'm like, well, like, that's random. No, (laughs) how am I supposed to know, (laughs) Cheryl, who your college roommate was? And lo and behold, it's Susan, the author of How to Work a Room. And I looked at Cheryl with bug eyes and I'm like, no way, (laughs) no way. And she's like, sure. And I bet she'd even be on your podcast. And Susan, look what's happening right now. Here you are. And it was great. Cheryl sent me an email and said, oh, one of my friends has a podcast and I couldn't speak for you. And here's what Cheryl did that was really interesting. And this is the people who have savvy. She came to me first and said, would you like to be on the podcast? She didn't make an assumption, right? She did not make an assumption. She did what Seth Godin talks about is get permission to give my contact information. First of all, she didn't have to go, are you kidding? Of course I do. But the reality is so often people talk about referrals and this and that and the other, and they forget to say, does this work for you? Is it okay? And she did that. It's not even all about being smart and savvy in business. She's thoughtful. It's respectful too. Exactly. Yeah. If you're going to connect two people together, you want to know that they want to be connected. Exactly. And then the rest is history. So the lesson is, let everyone who you know, even your college roommate, know what you're doing, what you're interested in. Let people know, even in a non-pushy way, hey, if you hear of anything you think I'd be interested in, let me know. Keep your antenna up. And not just for ourselves, because you might bump into someone who says, you know, I'm looking for someone who can custom make me a batch of cookies, can custom make me something that I want for my clients. And that might not be your specialty, but you have a friend and someone you might have even met through this podcast and say, you know what, I think I have the person for you. So I think having our antenna up, but not just for ourselves, is what really makes people feel not only that we're good networkers, that they want to know us. Exactly. And that we have other people in mind. We're not just there for our own personal gain. Absolutely. It's too self-aggrandizing to always be about ourselves. And if you never recommend other people, why on earth should anyone recommend you? Oh, that is good. came from a conversation I had last night with a fellow speaker who says, well, I don't like to recommend people. What if they do a bad job? I said, if you're going to recommend someone to a speech, they're going to bust their tushes to make sure they do a good job. Absolutely. But he can't talk about getting referrals. He won't give them. Well, you know what? That doesn't speak well of you. You miss the boat. That's right. There's a lot about mindset there, which I know we're going to get into, but I'm going to take this from the top again. And Susan, it's a little bit different for you maybe, but I'd like to start off our shows by having you describe yourself as a motivational candle because it gives our audience a little bit of a different way to understand what you're about. So if you were to give me a color and a quote, and maybe you're going to use this new one, I don't know. But on a candle that really speaks you, what would your motivational candle look like? Well, my motivational candle would be dripless because (laughs) when I read the notes, I go, yeah, it's got to be dripless. Do you know what it's like to get wax off your coffee table? (laughs) It's awful. So it would be dripless. And I think that's a great play on words. I don't want to be considered a drip. (laughs) There you go. So number one, in the scent, to me, it would have to have a scent. It can't just illuminate and glow. To me, there has to be a fragrance so that it's multi-sensory. And the fragrance would be something in the orange blossom to pumpkin to vanilla. Oh. Never lavender. I can't stand lavender. And what the glow would be in it, it would start like a little yellow, and then it would go kind of a hot pink orange, and red. Oh, I can see it. Yes. When I started speaking, and I still often do this, 
I said to my speech coach, I'm 4'11", and some of my audiences, there are 500 to 600 people in the room. They can't see me even on stage. I think I need to wear red. And I want to be known as the woman in red, which, by the way, was a movie with Gene Wilder, Mm -hmm. Richard Pryor. And she said, because she worked mostly in banking, she said to me, you know, Susan, red can be an incendiary color, and it could actually turn your audiences off if it's too bright. And I'm going to say this to our audience today. I listened to her for about a week, and then it was like I heard my grandmother's voice on my left shoulder. And I finally said to my speech coach, they are hiring me to learn how to be like me, not me to be like them. Ah, yeah. And I'm 4'11". Back in the day, nobody wore red and I needed people to see me, literally physically see me so that I didn't disappear. And I became the woman in red. I wore red suits for every speech, and I often still do. But now that I'm at a certain point of my life, and especially if I'm in a a weather belt that's way too hot for my red knit suits, I do different colors. But that red, so turning to red was really important. But I love orange. Orange is my favorite color, so it has to be yellow orange, shocking pink, red, which by the way, if you have a cataract like mine, you can't tell the difference in any of those colors. They all look the same. (laughs) Well, they're all hot colors. And that's really very reflective. And my motivational saying, well, it's really so many of the things that I heard growing up, but that one that I said, you never know. You can't assume anything about anyone. That's why we believe in serendipity and meant to be and coincidence and lanyap. You never know. You never know. But I'll tell you one thing we do know is if we stay in our house and don't move and don't get out and don't do anything, you know that nothing's going to happen. Oh, I'm so glad you said that. So let me give you my mother's version. And I can still see her (laughs) sitting at the kitchen table on Chase Avenue in Chicago saying to me, You never meet anyone sitting at home. That is the truth. Now, the truth is because of the internet, we can meet a lot of people, but they're not who they said they are. Oh, that's true. And the encouragement behind how to work room and everything I've done is go out among people. There is so much you can learn face to face that you will never learn online, through an email, through a text exchange, through an Instagram story, because it's a push out. It's not and interaction. Right. And I think all the subtle facial changes, tone of voice even. Yes. And just being next to somebody face to face and talking and interacting back and forth is a whole different dynamic. I mean, I'm not going to say that online isn't worth it. There's opportunities online, but it's not instead of, it's in addition to. That's exactly when I wrote, I think I wrote that in my most recent book. It's not an either or. It's a both and. All right, then. Well, we're going to get into a lot of details and specifics because Gift Biz listeners, Susan and I, in the beginning, before we actually hit play, talked about the fact that we're going to have some solid takeaways for you here. But first, there's a question I've really been interested in finding out from you, Susan, and that is how did you dive into just the thought of networking and that concept being such a driving force in your life? How did that start? Well, it's interesting. It started with what my mother told me. So she made you get out of the house. Yeah. Well, the other thing is, and people often ask me, how did you learn how to work a room? The first time I was asked that, I was like, what? Learned? And I said, oh, it's because my mother said, oh, we're having a family gathering. My family's in from Canada. Uh, make, go and talk to them and make sure they don't talk to so-and-so. That was a big job for a 12-year-old. But the expectation was, and it's very, I think, more common for women, that we are the ultimate hosts. We gather people. We welcome people. We make people feel comfortable. And I think that serves us well. So I grew up in Chicago, and there was so much of the Chicago lessons of what to do, not to do, that have a little more, shall we say, shady history. But I've learned my lessons well. But putting people together, 
I don't call that connecting. I mean, I love Malcolm Gladwell, and I love that he came up with the words, but I call it the old-fashioned word, matchmaking. So when you know people should meet, why wouldn't you introduce them? If you know someone that needs a graphic artist, why wouldn't you introduce them to your neighbor who has a son who's a graphic artist? Absolutely. This is how I live my life. How it got started is I started my business. I would go to events, and at one event, I was the featured person, but the microphone system was broken at the St. Francis Hotel in San Francisco, and I was so upset, so I thought the only thing I can do is make sure I go over and meet people, extend myself, shake their hands, and one guy watched me, and he said, he was a political handler, and he said, Susan, if you ever want to run for office, I want to be your chairperson, he said, because you know how to do something that most people don't. You know how to work a room. And I was working on the book. And that's the title. Oh, that's how it came about? The title came? That's how the title came because I was giving a talk using the word networking. And a woman who hired me said, Susan, our group is mostly men. And they think networking is very gender biased. They won't listen to you. You got to come up with a male appropriate title. He said that to me. We titled that my talk, and that's the title that went on the book. And just to say to our audiences, How to Work Room is a totally different book than The Secrets of Savvy Networking. There's no repetition. They're not the same skill. People use networking as an umbrella, but it's actually inaccurate because knowing how to work room is a social skill. It's the circulating in a room. It's socializing. Networking is really the follow-up where we do what we need to do to make sure we stay in touch, connect, etc. That's the follow-up behavior. Together, it's dynamite. So you use them in tandem. I use them in tandem. I never, ever, when people say, well, I'm going to network tonight, I look at them and go, well, first of all, grammar school teacher of grammar said, nah, that's wrong. I'm going to an event. I'm going to have a good time. I'm going to socialize. I'm going to circulate. That's not networking. Networking is actually the follow-up. So to me, it's some people think it's picky, but it's two different skills. I wrote two different books, but more than that, there are people, Sue, that really are great at working a room and socializing. You'd want them at any party, but they have no follow-up, so they're crappy networkers. And then there are people who are wonderful networkers. They follow up. They send you what they said they'd send you. They get in touch with you. They introduce you to people. And yet the thought of walking into a room full of people terrorizes them. Two different skills with 90% of us self-identifying as shy and maybe 40% saying that they're introverts. We really need both skills to build, manage, and create our businesses. Absolutely. Let's get into some of the specifics. So some of our listeners who might never have gone to a networking, well, I'm not even going to call it that now because you've just taught me differently, right? Well, that's what they call it. But you know, you're not networking. You're using the social skills your parents taught you. Right. Okay. So you're going to an event and let's say it's a structured event. So it's not a dinner party at your friend's house, but it's a chamber of commerce meeting or a BNI meeting or something like that, where the intent is people fully know that it's mostly business owners who are there. Maybe there's some people who are looking to start a business. But what do you say to those people who are like, I'm not doing that. It's too scary. To your point, I'm going to walk in, I'm not going to know anybody there, and no, I'm not doing it. How do you get someone over that hump? How about this? Let me say it in the most unhelpful way. Stop it! <laughs> First of all, there is a saying, you can build a better mousetrap if no one knows about it, so what? And I'm going to say it in a kinder way. What I just said, about 90, according to the research at the Stanford Shyness Clinic, about 90% of us self-identify as shy. You're not the only one that feels that way. You walk into a BNI meeting, a chamber of commerce reception, you know, your own professional association. Maybe it's even a fundraiser for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. We don't know people. 
So I'm going to give you a couple things that I've learned along the way. Number one, when I was doing a radio interview on NPR, a gentleman called in from Michigan and said, you know, this is what we used to say when we went into town for a dance. And I want you all to remember it and write this down. The roof is the introduction. If you're under the same roof, you already have something in common. You support that charity. You're in BNI. You're a chamber member or looking to be. There is already something in common. And by the way, the room could have no roof. I mean, it could be Wrigley Field. It could be a football stadium, a soccer stadium. It could be the outdoor field where your son or daughter is playing soccer and the other parents are there. So the concept is there doesn't have to be a physical roof. But if we go everywhere and before we go there, spend two minutes thinking, what do I have in common with the people there? You will be more prepared and you will find you're more comfortable. Okay, perfect. So the roof is the introduction. Everyone's coming together for some common reason. That's right. Now, the other part is the people that walk around saying, and we've been seeing a lot of this in many articles, I hate networking. Mm -hmm. Stop it. Here's what I've tweeted out. Nobody has said, I hate networking, who doesn't love getting a recommendation, a referral, a lead. So if you like being referred, if you like someone introducing you to potential clients, if you like being the recipient, then that means you love networking. What you don't like is walking into a room full of people you don't know. That's different. We've got to stop that. I hate networking. I'm an introvert, so I can't do it. It's funny. Before there was this whole hullabaloo around introverts and the book Quiet, the people who were shy, you never heard them say, I hate networking. These are people who are uncomfortable, but they want to be with people. They liked people. We need to supplant that attitude with, I have something that I'm creating, that I'm doing, And I want to have as many people benefit from it. The best way to do it is to get to know and talk to people who will tell other people, whether online or face-to-face. Got it. Let me give you some tips. Before you go anywhere, have your own self-introduction prepared. You'll feel so much better when you walk in a room and you know what you're going to say about yourself. Now, in spite of how a lot of people tell you about introductions, this is the Rowan self-introduction. Three traits. It is not 30 seconds or 15 seconds. It's a seven to nine second pleasantry. And by that, I mean, you're not given your whole spiel. It's not an elevator speech or pitch. It's a pleasantry where you give something about you as to why you're there in the room. That helps that other person have context for your presence. So A, it's seven to nine seconds. And I wondered, why did I say that? And I read my book and it's because the research from, I believe it was Dr. David Givens, is after nine seconds, do you know that eye contact is considered a glare? No kidding. Yeah. And I go, well, God, I was smart. I forgot that was the reason. So seven to nine seconds, it's a pleasantry. And if you're saying to someone, hey, it's really nice to meet you. Don't say it like this. Oh, it's so nice to meet you. Now, even if you're nervous and you want to sound like that, you have to sound enthusiastic. If you're going to say, I'm happy to meet you, that you are. So your voice, your face, your body language, you have to monitor that to make sure you look welcoming and how about this, approachable. Mm -hmm. Seven to nine seconds. The second thing you do is you let people know you're there and why you're there. So you may say, oh, well, you know, I'm here because I just started my business. I'm here because we're thinking of expanding into another market. Give people a reason for why you're there. It's like at a wedding. Nobody cares what you do at a wedding. They want to know, do you know the bride? Do you know the groom? So they can have context because we need to help people out and figure out what to talk to us about. So instead of giving your job title, give the benefit of what you do. The benefit of what you do. Yes. And I learned that from Patricia Fripp. She said to me, a title means nothing. But when you give the benefit, people know what they will get. And you also, she said, give them then the opportunity to ask a question 
start the conversation and they may ask you, well, what does that mean? And then you are invited to explain what you do and why you're there. Right. So this conversation, this portion that we're talking about right now is when you are walking into a room and you're minkling. So it's not in the point of a networking meeting where people are going up and doing their elevator speeches, the up and down. Now, this is when you're invited and it could be any event. You could be going to a conference, a meeting, an association, but even at a BNI meeting, there is a time right before the meeting that you have the opportunity to socialize. And that is the work the room. Or even after the meeting, you'll hear someone say something and you might have an idea or a thought or a question that won't come up in a structure. That's where you get to be social. The most confounding is the not structured event. That's very confounding for people. And then the third quality of what you do with people is you give them something to remember you by. So it's something that you've said, something that you tell them so that they can put in their brain who I'm talking to. Make sure you say your name clearly. And I know this is going to sound strange. Introduce yourself to people if you're not wearing a name tag. First and last names. Never just first name. Oh, interesting. Here's another tip from How to Work Room. When there's a name tag event, always make sure your name tag's on your right-hand side. Yep. I learned that from you years ago. (laughs) Yes, thank you. Because the line of sight is with the handshake. And it's real easy for someone to sneak a peek and catch up. So those are how we prepare ourselves. Seven to nine seconds give the benefit of what you do and give people something memorable, first and last names. Also, I don't care if you read the paper online, in print, go through a newspaper. Don't walk into any event where you don't know what's going on in the world, in the country, in your community, in your profession. You will have more conversation if you have stayed aware of Because there's nothing worse than someone saying, oh, did you hear that the youngest Jenner is worth, what did they say? I think I read it was like a couple billion dollars with her makeup line. That's actually being picked up all over. You should really know what's going on. Not that I give a thought about the Kardashian Jenners, but the idea is she's making the billionaires list. Well, it's a way to get off of conversation that's just the small banter. And that was going to be one of my questions because I so often find that we'll go in and start talking with someone and it's like, oh, well, you say your name, what company are you with? And then people will start giving the address of where the location is, like crazy things that don't even matter. And it's all just very surface level talk. You never get deeper. I can't wait for you to hear Susan's perspective on small talk. We're going to do that right after a word from our sponsor. This podcast is made possible thanks to the support of the Ribbon Print Company. Create custom ribbons right in your store or craft studio in seconds. Visit theribbonprintcompany.com for more information. Okay, I'm going to say something about that. I will suggest to everyone, a little different than what you said, is embrace small talk. And I'll tell you why. I don't consider the address as a detail that's irrelevant. Right. But the small talk of, oh, where did you go to school? Oh, my gosh, I had a friend that went there. Oh, I'm originally from Chicago, as you know. Oh, where did you? I meet people and I go, where'd you go to high school? Oh, where did you eat pizza? Now, a lot of people in a lot of other cities think, what are you asking me where I ate pizza from? But we all know that's a really important question. Because people bond about what they have in common. So whether it's we went to the same school, we like the same movies, we support the same teams. Once you find the common bond, something different happens, like you and I did when it was Cheryl. Right. Cheryl's stationary station, as we said in our pre-conversation, 40 years of successful stationery and gift store. Remarkable. But when you find something in common, someone in common... The conversation changes and then it segues into something deeper. Uh, One of my pet peeves are people that show up at networking events with the prescribed deep dive questions. And I am the person that will say, I don't even know you. You haven't earned the right to ask that. Get to know me. How can you figure out how you can help me if you don't 
have a conversation with me? How can I figure out how to help you if we haven't had a talk? And if you come up to me and go, well, I, and I actually know someone who did that and wrote about that in my book, Secrets of Savvy Networking. I really need leads to hotel restaurant managers. Uh, who are you? Yeah, I've seen that too. I agree with you in terms of the level of small talk and the connecting and finding some common ground. But I find some people, what will happen is they will say good morning and they'll talk about the weather and then they'll throw a business card at you. Oh, no. Those aren't people that know how to work a room. And I think people do that because they might be shy and that they might have gone to some program of someone that doesn't know what they're talking about of what networking is. That is not networking. A business card exchange comes after, in this country, comes after a conversation. In some countries, it proceeds, and there's a, in the Eastern countries, Japan, etc., so there's a more formalized process because it's a presentation of a business card. But in North America and in many parts of Europe, it follows up a conversation. Here's the whole key at all is really, Sue, is if you're in a room, you have the wonderful option of talking to people face to face. Have a conversation, find out what they're interested in. If you don't know something about what they're interested in, well, what if I don't know anything? I said, oh, even better. Oh, I'm not aware of that. Could you tell me more? Right. Okay, well, so now I have another question, and I'm going to put myself out on the line because I'm going to tell you what I tell people to do, and you're going to tell me if this is good advice or not, all right? So when I'm working with somebody and they are uncomfortable about networking, you and I spoke earlier about how much of an advocate I am, and most of our listeners know because I talk to them, you know, you should be out networking no matter what. But I also, when people are nervous and anxious and afraid to go in, I tell them, don't focus on yourself. What you're trying to do is focus and learn as much as you can about other people to see how you can help them. And then automatically it'll start turning around later to, oh, and also what do you do? But so if the focus is on nice to meet you, whatever all small talk, because I agree with the small talk there, and then your questions are all learning about them, not what do I say next about me? it makes everything so much easier because you're focusing out, you're not focusing in. What do you think about that? Well, absolutely. And I'm going to give this other thought that I, a woman said in a presentation I did in Hawaii, and it was such good advice, and I'm so glad she gave it to me so early on that I could share it. Instead of walking into a room going, oh, I'm so nervous, I don't like people, what if they do this? She said, you have to change that attitude to... What can I do to make them comfortable with me? Mm. And when you do that and you shift that attitude and you actually try to make people comfortable with you, they actually will get comfortable. When they're comfortable, they'll be more open. And then you're in a dialogue. So what you said is true. Also on conversation. Conversation is not 20 questions. Conversation is not an interrogation. The three, and I actually wrote, what do I say next, uh, still out there by Grand Central Publishing. The three aspects to conversation. I tell everyone, you can't miss if you go everywhere bringing your or. You'll paddle through any problem. And it stands for observe, ask, reveal. A conversation is not just questions. It's not just observations. And it's not just revealing, but it's a combination and I know someone whose idea of conversation is she asks 20 questions. And I'm going to tell you why we shouldn't do that. Number one, we will appear nosy. Number two, you can say, well, I'm just curious. But the most important thing is you put someone else on the spot to do all the talking. Yeah. You have to bring your story, your comments. One of the things I share with people is if someone's talking about something that you really don't know, but you have a friend, like I don't have a dog. I can't share dog stories, but I borrow my friend's dog stories. So if someone's talking about their pet, I borrow if it's a golden, I have my friend with the golden stories. I have the Bajan stories. So here's the underscore to this, the Rowan tip, borrow other people's lives. That's how we help connect with people when we don't have that direct experience. Interesting. 
Yeah, so you tell a story from someone else that's relevant to the conversation. That's relevant to the conversation. It's like, oh, how about this? I am never jumping out of a plane that is in good working condition. I have a friend who's a skydiver. Someone talks about, oh, I'm doing this skydive for my birthday. Well, I try not to roll my eyes because that would be a good thing. <laughs> but then the next thing is I shared Jim's story mm -hmm. of how he got started. Actually, he wanted me to go skydiving. And three people who love and adore me said, no, you're not doing it. I said, okay. But you see, if you borrow other stories or if you've read or if you read the paper, you'll read about. And that's how you build the conversation. If people say, I'm too busy to read the paper, but now we have these wonderful content curators, you can decide what information you want and get that into your inbox every day. You know what I use? I use the week. 10 points that you should know that happened that the day before, something to talk about. I have the skim delivered. Have you heard of the skim? Oh, me too. Yeah. Oh, no, I've been getting the skim for a couple years. Yes. The skim is good. Bustle is good. I also get, because I have to know what's going on, I get Axios. I get Politico. I make sure, besides, I read three print newspapers a day and two online. Oh, my gosh. How do you get anything else done? That's a lot. <laughs> you skim it. I skim, but I sometimes wonder, and I wonder why I do that. And I realized when I grew up in Chicago, there were four newspapers, two morning and two afternoon, and they all came to my house. I saw my parents read papers, but I also saw what a great conversationalist my mother was. You know, it occurs to me as you were talking about that in terms of borrowing other people's stories and what you were just talking about, too, about making people comfortable with you is if you can borrow someone else's story or to your point about knowing something current where you can keep the conversation going, ultimately, then it will get back on to, because you know how conversations go, it's one topic morphs into another, <laughs> morphs That's into right. another. So the whole point is, I think, person to person interaction, and you're getting to know people by having that interaction, versus always the content you're delivering and telling them what you're doing. And like, we we're just talking about passing out all these cards and all that. It's getting someone to like you and want to talk more with you through these series of conversations that then leads to what you would really define as networking, which is afterwards, right? That's exactly right. That's beautifully said. What you're building, and this is, everyone says the word, and a lot of people actually are so robotic about it. I don't believe a word they say. But what you're saying is what you're building is connection. You're building relationships. Which then can lead on to business exchange, referral exchange, any of that. Exactly. People, this is, oh my gosh, the guy that uh, did Megatrends, he wrote a book with one of his wives. And one of the tenets that they discovered is, and people quote it all the time, but they don't actually know where they're quoting. It's, they did the research and found people do business with people they know, like, and trust. And the more you can get to know people via conversation, communication, staying in touch, the deeper you build the trust and the relationship. Especially face-to-face. -face. Absolutely. When face-to-face -face came out, it unfortunately came out the week that the economy crashed. But when I wrote the original proposal, and that's got to be 15 years ago, it was called The Human Touch. I changed the subtitle and they let me go with it which was uh, how to reclaim the personal touch in a digital world. And that book came out 10 years ago. That is now the biggest issue we have or problem we have is that we've lost a lot of personal touch. And that will propel you further. In fact, a research that said, you know how people say don't have meetings, they're boring. And they found out that Actual, the meetings and some of the things we think are outdated are how people connect with each other on the job, through their organizations, etc. So, yeah, the face-to-face -face is ultimately important. And if you are in a different geographic location and you want to meet with someone, meet on Skype or Zoom or FaceTime. Right. It's almost person-to-person. -person. It's face-to-face. It might not be in person, but it's face to face. That does wonders. That's how you have a global community.
this guy and I, we think of ourselves, oh, you'll love this story. We think our, of ourselves as best friends. He's in England. He's introduced to me by Ivan Meisner, who founded BNI. We're doing a Google Hangouts. I don't like Google Hangouts, but I really like Skype and Zoom. And he's from England. So I happen to say, well, perhaps, you know, my friend's brother. And he goes, oh, I think I heard of him. And I said, well, maybe, you know, of this sister-in-law who's quite the star. He goes, I just read a book about her. I was in love with her. I had her picture on my wall as a kid. It changed everything. Now we are really good buds. And here's the best thing. Two years ago, I was texting my cousin a New Year greeting, and she came back and wrote me and said, oh, my friend Ian has a cousin that talks about networking. Perhaps you know him and sends me my friend Andy Lapata's URL. I go, no, no, him. <laughs> now, this is in Chicago. He's in England. I'm in San Francisco. I immediately send him an email going, well, the first cousin's network is working. My first cousin's friends with his first cousin. Oh, my gosh. That's crazy. But, folks, I tell this story because it is a you never know. If we don't talk to people, we don't find out who we have in common, what we know in common, what we like in common. But I'm going to tell you about my second cousin because it goes exactly to what everyone listening who is a maker does. My cousin, Renee owned Rene's Sauces and Salad Dressings in Canada. Here's how it came about. And by the way, whenever I meet someone from Canada, I say, oh, do you use your Rene's Sauces and Salad Dressings? Oh, well, yes, I love their creamy garlic. I go, it's my cousin. <laughs> and then we have a salad dressing conversation. And I tell them this story because she's in my book, How to Create Your Own Luck. She had an allergy to the things we put in food. So she couldn't use salad dressing, so she would make her own. And it was one holiday season. It was time for Christmas and Hanukkah. And she had three kids, a second grade teacher, not a lot of money. So she made salad dressing for all their friends. It was quite cute. She said the red and green bows went on the Christmas ones. The blue bows went on the Hanukkah salad dressing jars. Two weeks later, she started getting calls from friends. Do you have any more? No. Could you make me some? And she said, yeah, I'm going to sit and beat 20 eggs. You know? <laughs> and then finally, a friend called and said, what would you charge me for another jar? And she blew it off. And her husband, Arnie, said, why don't we find out? Yeah, she had some market research she didn't even know she was getting. Exactly. When the marketplace asks you, give them an answer. Turns out they started the company and she started making just salad dressing in her kitchen. She sold the company a couple of years ago to Heinz. I was in the factory the last time I was in Toronto. Folks, what started as I'm allergic to the gunk in pre-made whatever, that's before we had gluten-free as a panacea. She did something because necessity is the mother of invention. And it turned into her business. The same Mrs. Fields with the cookies. Right. We, there are so many role models of people who did things. And someone said, gee, these are so good. What would you charge me for that? Let's find out the answer. Keeping yourself open. And scaling. Some people want to scale up. Other people are happy just to have the business in one location. Some people are happy to do it online and not have brick and mortar. There's so many ways to build a business. Absolutely true. But to what you were saying earlier, people have to know about your business and not just people in business meetings, but your family and friends, like with your cousin's stories. So you have to get the word out. And that circles all the way back to, I don't know, we need a new word for networking. Yeah. Communication sharing. Or I don't know what it needs to be. You know what? That is what it is. It's being connected, communicating. The networks are really interesting because it actually comes from physics. I know I'm the only person who writes on networking who actually read Linked by Dr. Barabasi, who is a physics PhD professor, because so much of that goes back to physics and how neurons and all that uh, string theory, believe it or not. But it is about these networks. And you know what? You don't just have one network. I've had people say to me, well, I really don't have a network. And I have a neighbor who says, I'm not a social person. I don't have a network. Yes, you do. You live next door to one. You went to school with one. You went to camp with one. You play bocce ball with one. Your kids are in a soccer group with other parents who are one. Your fellow workers 
their one. And really, you know, how about your family? And some people took issue with this when I wrote in Secrets of Savvy Networking, not only your family, your cousins, but how about this? Your cousins' cousins, they're not related to you, but they ought to know about you. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't mean that you are selling them, but it means that you're in communication with them. They know what you do. They might be able to offer and refer you to somebody else. There's that word refer, which we can question, but everyone does have a network. And whenever I think of networking, I think of one person who used to work for me a long time ago. Her name was Kristen. I don't know how she came about being a networker, but between her clients and her friends and all the people that you just said here, Susan, I got to tell you, she was always connecting everybody. That's right. She was the one where I got that thinking of you think about what you can do to help somebody else versus having the microscope on you and what you can tell somebody about you. I want you to know she never had to go and look for another job. Clients and other businesses sought her out, recruiters. Everybody knew who she was. Now, she was good at her job, too, but I think it was really through all of her networking. But you just hit the magic. You have to have the skill. You have to have the talent. You have to have the know-how, the wherewithal. It is hard work. And by the way, being a good networker is not instead of being good at what you do. It's in addition. But she's that node in the network. She's that, I never ride a bicycle, but you know how all the spikes come off that Mm -hmm. The spokes, the spokes all come out from a central unit. Yeah, she's the central unit. But what she also did is she stayed in touch with people. And I bet, and this is something I want to tell you, I hear this a lot about networking. Oh, I want to have great strategies and leverage my contacts. Mm, Yeah, I've heard that. And I find that reprehensible because really what you want to do is let people know what you do, but you also want to be the person that people want to know. So you're going to have to be, and I know this is going to sound extremely old school, go everywhere and just be nice to people. Think of how to make them feel comfortable with you. What that woman told me in Hawaii has served me for the longest time. And you build a network from there. You don't want anyone in your network that gives you agita and makes you feel like you're going to have an ulcer attack. And you will never, I've told this to people, when I refer a speaker to an organization, I say to them, I am only referring people who not only have the expertise to speak about this area, but who you'll enjoy working with. I never recommend anyone who is an ulcer creator. Yeah. So I think that woman that you know, that's what happens. And people will say, but I work harder than she does. But you don't have the relationships. It's all relationships. It all comes back to relationships. You're totally right. Susan, we could go on and keep talking. I know you probably have a million other stories, but I'm sure you have other things that you need to do today. I'm getting my hair colored in an hour. If you don't think that's (laughs) the most important thing in my week, oh my God. Well, secret is I have an appointment this afternoon as well. So how about that? (laughs) Seriously, I'm not kidding. (laughs) See what we just did? We revealed a little something, truth about our life, connected, shared a laugh. Yeah. What do you think that does? So don't be afraid to share some things. But like, as one woman said to me, my son was in juvie for the weekend and I never shared that with anyone. (laughs) Yeah, it endears you. And it's okay to also share weaknesses, I think, too. You know, it doesn't have to be all bravo. Oh, yes. If you are vulnerable, I think that's one of the things that people find attractive in people when they are vulnerable. That's not my skill. I really don't know about it. I'm really a bad techie. I may be great at social media, but who knows when it comes to, oh my God, how do I get the microphone into this? It doesn't quite work. But you know what? When you share vulnerability, you never know. You could be talking to the person that says, oh, I know how to do that. Let me help you. Oh, my cousins can do that. Let me introduce you. Share vulnerability. But I will say this, on my tour, there is a wonderful sign that says everything about me because it says, Martha Stewart doesn't live here. (laughs) That's good. And we all can't be good at everything. And it's crazy to even think you can. And I say to people, in terms of our makers who are making 
baking products, why would I take business away from someone who can bake a bread and make a brownie and try it myself? They're trying to make a living. I have to support them. Love that. Well, you have supported my community in such a wonderful way today because the information that you're providing is so good. And I told you before, I want to motivate everybody to get out there and to be in communication with other people. See, I'm trying to learn different words to use because it can be valuable. It's reciprocal. It can be valuable to both. Now, Susan, I'd like to present you with a virtual gift. It's a magical box containing unlimited possibilities for your future and what comes next. So this is your dream or your goal of almost unreachable heights that you'd wish to obtain. Please accept this gift and open it in our presence right here. What's inside your box? I was hoping it would be five pounds less, but that is not what you could give me as a gift. I got to <laughs> do that on my own. What would be in my box? And I actually thought about it. What would be in my box, because this is what's important to me, would be the airplane and train tickets so I could visit face-to-face -face around the country and the world with the people who are in my life who are just one hug or plane ride away. That's the first thing. I'm a big believer in that. In fact, I was speaking in Nashville, and I said, oh, I'm in the neighborhood. I better go to Charlotte and visit my adopted family. So I think the face-to-face -face that would be helped by a plane ticket, that would be in my box. That would be one thing. The other thing that would really be important to me is having in my box the certificate of good health, the good health certificate, because so little matters if one does not have good health. And I, luckily, I think I have it. I'm knocking on wood because I'm superstitious. But I think a good health certificate, and that really means that all of us that have our own businesses and our own practices, that we really need to make sure that we're exercising, eating right, don't do the things that don't help us, and stay in good health. Because when you see someone that doesn't have it, you appreciate it so much better. Yeah, you sure do. And then you have to remember and appreciate it every day when you do have it, for sure. Yeah. And I think the third thing in my box, because this is how I make my living and this is what I love doing, and that is invitations to be hired to speak at conferences, organizations, meetings, universities, at schools. Because to me, spreading the word, which I've done for over three decades, of how we can meet, mingle, become mingling mavens, overcome our shyness, adapt our introversion into a way that works for us and make friends. Because ultimately, Sue, all the research shows the people that live longer, healthier lives are the people who have friends and relationships. Well said. And I've heard that research too. You're right. Susan, thank you so, so much for being here today. If our listeners want to know more about you, where would you direct them to go? My website is susanroan.com, S-U-S-A-N-R-O-A-N-E.com. You can also get to it by going to howtoworkaroom.com. Thank you so much. And Susan, I really think that we've accomplished what we set out to do today. We had our objective in the beginning, and I think we landed it. What do you think? I would agree. And I think this, because you and I are so much on the same page, we just want everyone listening in your community to know that the sooner and the more often you do the face-to-face, -face, I think the quicker and the more valuable your business will grow. I don't even want to say anything more. I want to end it there because that was the best final statement that you could give. Susan, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time today. My pleasure. Are you discouraged because your business is not performing as you had envisioned? Are you stuck and confused about how to turn things around? Sue's new best-selling book is structured to help you identify where the holes are in your business and show you exactly how to fix them. You'll learn from Sue and owners just like you who are seeing real growth and are living their dream. Maker to master. Find and fix what's not working in your small business. Get it on Amazon or through www.giftbizunwrapped.com slash